Thank you very much. And that concludes general questions. Uh, we're going to turn to First Minister's questions. And before we take the first question, uh, I believe the First Minister would like to make a statement about the uh, anniversary of the Lockerbie tragedy 30 years ago. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to uh, reflect briefly on tomorrow's 30th anniversary of the Lockerbie bombing. Tomorrow, the Solicitor General is attending events in the United States and the Lord Advocate will represent the Scottish Government at the memorial service in Lockerbie. I know that several local MSPs will also be attending commemorations. However, I'm sure that everyone in this chamber will reflect on the anniversary in some way. First and foremost, we will remember those who died on the 21st of December 1988. 270 people from a total of 21 nations. We will think about all those who lost loved ones and we will also think about everyone affected by the tragedy. For example, our emergency services who worked so hard in such incredibly difficult and traumatic circumstances. And of course, we will think about the residents of Lockerbie itself. In doing so, we will reflect on how an almost unimaginable tragedy brought out incredible reserves of solidarity, compassion and love. The bereaved showed immense dignity and resilience. People in Lockerbie and the surrounding area opened their hearts to those who had lost loved ones. Enduring ties and friendships have been created. For example, Syracuse University, which lost 35 of its students in the bombing, now accepts two scholarship pupils every year from Lockerbie Academy. That is a powerful example of the way in which people have worked to remember the past in a way which also builds hope for the future. That hope is also now part of the legacy of Lockerbie. And that is perhaps something to hold in our hearts tomorrow as we look back on the tragedy, as we think about all those who lost loved ones, and as we remember and honour all those who died. Thank you very much. We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I associate myself entirely with the remarks the First Minister has made and the, the remarks that the Prime Minister made yesterday? Um, as I was preparing for Christmas that year, so were the Somerville family. Uh, Jack Somerville had been the retail vehicle sales manager in our family business for some 20 years before he'd retired. I remember him with great affection. Yes, he had a sheepskin coat, like all the best used car sales managers. Uh, he was fond of a cigar, he was a big personality. He and his family were in the house in which the plane landed and were obliterated. And I know I and many of his former colleagues, along with all those who lost relatives and friends, uh, think fondly of them uh, each year when this anniversary comes around. Uh, presiding officer, punctuality in our train service reaching its worst point for 12 years. Hundreds of trains cancelled and shortages of staff because people are being trained to use the new class of trains which are also delayed, causing another 100 services to be cut last month. Doesn't the First Minister think train passengers across Scotland are owed an apology? First Minister. Yes, yes I do, and ScotRail has made very clear uh, that they regret the cancellations and the delays that have been caused as a result. Let me be perfectly clear, the level of cancellations uh, this week in particular has been unacceptable. Of course, these have been due to a combination of factors, not least train crew shortages, but also a number of other issues. Infrastructure issues like Monday's signals failure at Perth have accounted for a significant number, uh, and these cannot simply be laid at the door of ScotRail. Tragically, we must also recognise that understandable knock-on disruption has followed the loss of life on the railways this week, and I'm sure the sympathies of everyone in the chamber uh, go to the families and loved ones uh, of those who have died. That said, I want to be very clear that we've seen a significant and unacceptable number of delays that are clearly the responsibility of ScotRail. Uh, I can report to Parliament that cancellations of this type have fallen as the week has progressed from around 144 on Monday to an estimated 40 today. Uh, progress is being made, but it is not good enough. Uh, we expect, indeed we demand, better from the rail operator uh, and the Transport Secretary uh, continues to work closely with them to ensure that we continue to see impro improvements in the days to come. Jackson Carlo. Well, it's interesting because, in fact, we've got new official figures that show that since 2011, there have, in fact, been more than 35,000 cancellations or park cancellation, cancellations caused entirely by ScotRail. That amounts to some 5,000 a year. And people want to know why this SNP government is failing to deliver. Let's just examine their record. 
Two years ago, the last time we had problems on the tracks, the then Transport Minister, Hamza Yusuf, played the big man and hauled in ScotRail, threatening, and I quote, serious consequences. They were left in no uncertain terms that I expect improvement, he fumed. And yet, what's happened since? Punctuality has fallen. And instead of serious consequences, Mr. Yusuf has done a ministerial bunk to the Justice Department, where he's now clearing up the mess left by Mr. Matheson, while Mr. Matheson has swapped seats to clear up the mess left by Mr. Yusuf. <laughs> Talking tough, cabinet musical chairs, failing to deliver improvements, then giving in. Isn't that the record of this government on our rail network? First Minister. I'm not sure the Tories are on particularly safe ground here, but we will uh, leave that to one side for the moment. Of course, uh, when Hamza Yousaf, then the Transport Minister, uh, took that action uh, with ScotRail, we, we did see improvements. While I'm not standing here and saying that the performance of ScotRail is good enough, because it is not, in terms of punctuality in particular, the performance of ScotRail uh, is usually better than the performance of other uh, large train operators elsewhere in the UK. Our responsibility, though, is to continue to work with ScotRail to deliver improvements. In the last uh, few weeks, uh, there have been issues with shortages of uh, train crews. As uh, ScotRail has set out, these are uh, largely down to uh, two issues as they've introduced the new timetable. Uh, the introduction of that has been impacted by, yes, the late delivery of the Hitachi uh, trains. There aren't uh, the number quite of the Hitachi trains yet in service uh, as were expected. There also, of course, was the industrial action, which I'm glad to see is now resolved. Uh, ScotRail are working hard uh, to resolve these issues, as I've said. Not, again, not saying that this is good enough, and I absolutely recognise the frustration of the travelling public, but we have, over the course of this week, uh, seen the number of cancellations reduced, and I expect to see that number continue to reduce and expect to see continued improvement over the next few days, particularly as we go into the holiday period and then uh, into the new year period. Uh, the Transport uh, Secretary uh, discusses these issues regularly uh, with uh, Scott Rail. He spoke to both uh, the managing directors of Scott Rail and Abelio earlier this week and made clear uh, the urgent need for improvement. Jackson Carlo. <laughs> right. Well, let's recall something else from two years ago. <laughs> Then the Transport Minister came forward and handed out £3 million worth of discounted fares following the disruption. This, he said, was to thank passengers for their patience. Two years on, it's not passengers who are getting a break, it's the train operator, because the current Transport Minister decided to waive sanctions that they were facing for missing targets. Why? Because they would have breached the franchise agreement had the targets been kept in place. So, so support for passengers one year, a bailout for train operators the next. Who is getting the better deal here, First Minister? Scotland's hard-pressed commuters or the owners of the rail franchise? Yeah. First Minister. Tough sanctions in place uh, for failure to deliver, and it's right and proper that that is the case. Uh, of course, passengers make a contribution towards the cost of running the railway through rail fares. And again, I absolutely understand uh, the frustration of passengers when they're paying through rail fares and not getting the performance uh, they deserve. However, in Scotland, I think it's important to stress that it's the Scottish Government that meets the majority of the cost of rail passenger services in Scotland. We've taken action to minimise the impact on passengers by capping increases for regulated ScotRail peak fares at the level of RPI. Uh, regulated off-peak fare increases are capped uh, at 1% lower than inflation. And that means that in Scotland, average uh, rail fares increases are actually lower than they are in England and Wales. So we will continue uh, to do what we can uh, to keep the level of rail, rail fares as reasonable as possible. And we will continue the work to invest in our railways uh, to improve the number and the quality of services and yes to ensure that ScotRail is taking the action it needs to take to resolve the difficulties that have been experienced in recent weeks. Jackson Carlow. Well, that was so downbeat I don't think it will be going faster than the slowest train. I mean I'm afraid it's classic SNP. One minute they're talking tough telling everyone they're going to sort things out. Two years down the line when things have actually got worse it's all somebody else's fault and while passengers are still waiting trains are late and millions of pounds are lost to the Scottish economy. Ministers do have a role to play, to hold management to account and to stand up for hard-pressed passengers. So as well as having, I hope, a very Merry Christmas, will she, what will she and her ministers do to ensure that in 2019 we have a railway network in Scotland that is fit for purpose? First Minister. To do 
the hard work to make sure that these issues are resolved, to make sure that ScotRail continues to perform better than other train operators elsewhere in the UK. Uh, we'll continue to take forward the work uh, to allow a public sector bid for the next rail franchise. And of course, uh, we will do what I would expect the architects of privatisation on the Tory benches uh, will oppose tooth and nail. We'll continue to argue for full devolution of all powers over the railways so we're responsible for network rail as well as ScotRail and so that this parliament does have the opportunity to nationalise our railways and to undo the damage of privatisation caused by the Tories. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, uh, can I associate uh, my party with the remarks made by the First Minister about the Lockerbie tragedy? I uh, recently visited the Drivesdale Cemetery in the Garden of Remembrance to pay my respects and I found it to be uh, a very, very moving experience. Presiding officer, can I turn to uh, a question which um, I think um, is very topical because today our schools are getting ready to break up for the Christmas holidays. And can I remind the Chamber that back in October, the First Minister encouraged Scotland's teachers to write to her with any concerns that they had about Scotland's schools. So here is a comment addressed directly to the First Minister just last week from a school teacher in North Lanarkshire. She wrote, despite what you have said yourself on many occasions, it is becoming clear that education is not a priority for this government. First Minister, is this teacher wrong? First Minister. Job uh, to demonstrate to her that that is not the case. Education is a priority for this government. That is why we are continuing to ensure investment in our schools. For the last couple of years, as we've uh, narrated in this chamber before, we've seen investment in our schools increase. We've also seen the action taken by this government through the Pupil Equity Fund to get more resources direct uh, to head teachers. We've seen in the statistics published last uh, week the rising uh, number of teachers in our schools. Uh, we're also seeing uh, evidence that the attainment gap in our schools is starting to close, as is the attainment gap in terms of access to universities. And of course, we see standards in our schools uh, generally continue to improve. So we will continue to do the hard work uh, to continue that progress uh, and to persuade that teacher and all of the other teachers uh, across uh, the whole of the country uh, that we value what they do uh, and that we consider education to be the top priority that it rightly is. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, the letter I quoted uh, is from a teacher called Esther. It was published in the Scottish Educational Journal. Esther is not only a lifelong SNP voter, she is also an SNP member and a local activist. But her concern about workload and the pressure on Scotland's teachers is now so grave that she writes of, and I quote, a crisis where schools are understaffed and asks you directly, for First Minister, how can we close the attainment gap when our schools do not have enough teachers? And she is not alone. Dean, another teacher and another SNP member, wrote in the same journal, I hear the rhetoric that Scottish education is at the forefront of the Scottish Government's priorities, but see little evidence of this. Presiding officer, when we raise concerns about education on behalf of teachers and parents, the First Minister chooses not to listen. Will she at least listen now to the grave concerns being openly expressed by members of her own party? First Minister. I have to say, I, I, li I listen very carefully every time uh, Richard Leonard uh, rises to his feet uh, in this chamber. Of course, we listen uh, carefully to the views of teachers and parents uh, and young people across the country. If we take uh, teacher numbers in particular, we saw just last week a rise of almost 500 in the numbers of teachers in our schools. That follows a rise in the year before and the year before that as well. I think since I became First Minister, teacher numbers have increased by more than 1,000. The numbers of teachers working in our primary schools right now is at the highest level since I was at primary school in 1980. So uh, the investment that we are ensuring in our schools is delivering 
delivering uh, those numbers of teachers. It's also delivering resources for head teachers to target the attainment <coughs> gap uh, and uh, see that attainment gap start to narrow. Uh, so we will continue to support teachers as best we can. Of course, we have an ongoing uh, negotiation around a revised pay officer offer to teachers. It's, as, as I say, under negotiation just now. I would simply note in passing that Labour councillors at COSLA uh, voted against last week making a revised pay offer uh, to teachers. Uh, so we want to support teachers by resources in the classroom, by numbers of teachers in the classroom, and by making sure they're fairly and properly rewarded for the excellent job that they do as well. So we will continue uh, as we go into the new year uh, in getting on with that job. Richard Leonard. Presiding officer, all I'm asking the First Minister to do is to listen to members of her own party. There are 3,000 fewer teachers in our classrooms than when the SNP came to power. No progress has been made in closing the attainment gap and Scotland is facing its first teacher strike since Margaret Thatcher was in Downing Street. The First Minister tells us, again, she said this morning that education is her top priority. But parents don't believe that. Teachers don't believe that. And now even her own party members don't believe that either. So, presiding officer, can the First Minister tell us why anybody in Scotland should believe that education is her top priority? First Minister. Teacher, as I've just said, teacher numbers are rising. Richard Leonard cannot deny that because the figures speak very clearly from themselves. As I said a moment ago, the numbers of teachers in our primary schools is at the highest level since 1980. I think the number of teachers overall is at the highest level since around 2010. So teacher numbers uh, are rising. We are seeing the attainment gap starting to close. It is simply not true for Richard Leonard uh, to say that that is not the case. And in terms of uh, the comment Richard Leonard uh, just made about the prospect of industrial action in our schools, uh, I do not want to see that happen and I will work as hard as I possibly can to avoid that. That's why uh, thanks to SNP uh, councillors and others at COSLA on Friday, a revised offer on pay has been made to teachers. And I say again, and I ask Richard Leonard to reflect on this very carefully, Labour councillors at COSLA voted against a revised offer being made. If it had been down to Labour councillors at COSLA last week, there would be no revised offer to teachers on the table. And as a result of that, it would be the case that industrial action was closer. So perhaps Richard Leonard uh, needs to reflect on the actions of his own party, just as I will continue to listen to members of mine and to teachers across the country. We have some constituency questions, uh, supplementaries. The first from Claire Baker. Um, thank you. Uh, President Officer, many people will have been shocked by the content of the BBC documentary on the death of Sheikh Hubayu in police custody. The programme highlighted concerns over the police's response, the Perk investigation and how the family was treated. I appreciate this is currently a live case and the First Minister may feel restricted in her response. But does she recognise that the BBC programme shone a light on serious concerns over deaths in custody in Scotland that the government have to deal with? Will the First Minister commit today to holding a comprehensive inquiry into deaths in custody in Scotland? First Minister. Can I thank Claire Baker for raising an extremely important issue. Can I also thank her for recognising that what I can say in response is restricted by the fact that this is an ongoing uh, live uh, case. Uh, yes, though I do recognise the concerns that uh, would have been and have been raised uh, by the BBC documentary, although I cannot go into the detail uh, of those concerns. Uh, however, in terms of the Sheikho Bio case, I, I want to uh, say a, a couple of things. Uh, I've said uh, these things, I think, before in the Chamber. Uh, firstly, as, and I'm sure I speak for everybody in the Chamber when I say uh, that my thoughts are very much with the family and friends of Mr Bayo as we approach Christmas at what will be an extremely difficult time for them. In terms of a public inquiry into uh, that case and the more general issues raised by that case, as I've said before, that has absolutely not been ruled out uh, by the government. However, as Claire Baker is aware, the process to decide whether or not there will be a criminal prosecution 
in this case, which is a process uh, governed by the Lord Advocate completely independently of ministers, is not yet concluded. Uh, when that process has concluded, obviously the government will consider very carefully next steps uh, at that point. And as I've said uh, before, obviously one of the options uh, open to the government is a full public inquiry, and that is certainly not uh, something that has been ruled out at all by the government. Tom Mason to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Tom Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sure the First Minister will, will, will be aware of the reports this morning that the mechanical project services firm Richard Irvin, based in Aberdeen, has gone into administration with the expected loss of 110 jobs. This, <coughs> this is clearly a distressing time for all involved. Therefore, can I ask what assistance the Scottish Government is able to provide so that staff are not struggling with Christmas just around the corner? First Minister. Well, can I thank the member for raising this issue? And yes, this will be an extremely uh, difficult and stressful time for the employees of uh, this company. Uh, in these circumstances, as the member will be aware, uh, the government's PACE initiative offers assistance to employees to look for alternative employment. But before uh, that, or often simultaneously with that, uh, the government is always keen to talk to companies to see uh, whether there is any action uh, we can take to help avoid uh, redundancy situations. So uh, I will ask the uh, employment uh, economy, rather, secretary, uh, to correspond uh, with the member about the actions the government is taking. And uh, we will do everything we possibly can, not just in the run-up to Christmas, but after that, to provide all possible assistance to those affected. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Jamie Green. The First Minister will be aware of the decision by Vertex to resubmit Ocambi to the Scottish Medicines Consortium and to submit Simkevi for the first time. And their very welcome agreement with the Scottish Government about access to Ocambi now for individual patients as part of the PAX2 process. So I want to place on record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary for Health and her officials, the cross-party group of MSPs, including Alex Neil, Anas Sawa and Miles Briggs, and of course the Daily Record for their tireless support. I know the Gallicas and all the families are delighted <coughs> and regard this as a wonderful Christmas present. Will the First Minister ensure that PACS 2 requests are considered quickly and that there is no delay within health boards for people with cystic fibrosis to access the drug? First Minister. Well, I'm very pleased indeed to confirm to Parliament that Vertex Pharmaceuticals has agreed to make submissions for their cystic fibrosis medicines to the Scottish Medicines Consortium. Uh, this follows uh, constructive discussions between the Scottish Government and the company to ensure that our new medicines appraisal process is as flexible as possible while ensuring rigour in its assessment. The company has also confirmed that each of their applications will be submitted with a patient access scheme to improve the cost effectiveness of their uh, proposals. Of course, the decisions as to whether these medicines will be made available are, of course, taken by the SMC independently of government. But I want to also recognise the very hard work of the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Scottish Government officials uh, to get to this point, and of course all of those, including Jackie Bailey, who have campaigned uh, to uh, make progress on this as well. I think it is important to say that in the meantime, while these considerations are ongoing after the submissions are made, uh, where these medicines are prescribed through the new peer-approved clinical system for individual patient access to medicines, Vertex has agreed to make these available to the NHS with a discount. Uh, so these, that is a process that is available to clinicians and to patients, and it's one that I would expect all health boards to operate as quickly as possible. But I hope uh, this is good news uh, that will be welcomed across the chamber, and particularly I know it is news that will be welcomed by the many families uh, that are affected by cystic fibrosis. And Jamie Green. Presenting officer, the First Minister will be aware of the news today that Ferguson Marine in Port Glasgow posted a loss of £60 million in 2016. Uh, the Yard blames, uh, and I quote, interference and disruption from the Scottish Government for this loss. Does the First Minister recognise that assertion? First Minister. Far from interference and disruption, the Scottish Government has, uh, as has been uh, debated in this chamber, I think, uh, on many occasions, uh, worked very hard to help and support Ferguson Marine to deliver the ferries uh, that they are uh, currently contracted uh, to deliver and also, of course, to diversify uh, their business. It was, uh, of course, action by this government uh, when it was under previous ownership that stopped uh, the shipyard from closing and it will continue to be action 
uh, by this government in support uh, of those uh, who own, operate and run the shipyard that I hope will see it continue to have a very bright future. Question number three, Willie Rennie. The Prime Minister is indulging in a form of psychological no-deal warfare in a desperate gamble to revive her dead deal. The SNP have been on a journey and are now giving wholehearted support for a people's vote. Hallelujah. The Conservative councillors in Perth backed a people's vote this week. Amber Rudd indicated possible support yesterday. And Sarah Williston said she would quit the Conservatives if they backed a no-deal Brexit. Momentum is with us. What can the First Minister do to get the leadership of the Labour Party on board? First Minister. I'm sorry, presiding officer, the, the noise in the chamber, which I'm not sure whether that was people laughing uh, with Willie Rennie or, or otherwise, uh, obscured the, the end of his question. So my apologies, I didn't quite uh, catch what you were asking me, but I think I got the gist uh, of, of the question. Um, I think momentum uh, is building. I would agree with Willie Rennie. I'm not sure it's building for the Liberal Democrats, but I think it is building uh, in support of a second EU referendum that give people across the UK the opportunity to change their minds. Of course, people in Scotland don't need to change their minds because we voted to remain the first time round. Uh, that vote has been ignored and I hope Willie Rennie uh, will agree with me that if there is another referendum, uh, the vote of the people of Scotland should be recognised and should be respected. Uh, I have to say right now, the biggest barrier uh, to making uh, decisive progress in this direction is the Labour Party uh, at Westminster. Uh, it is inexplicable to me why they have not thus far supported the SNP, the Liberal Democrats, the Greens and Plaid Cymru in bringing a vote of no confidence in this incompetent, sorry, Tory government. Uh, if that motion passed, we get rid of that incompetent government. And if it doesn't pass, it forces Jeremy Corbyn to take a decision on a second EU referendum. So uh, perhaps instead of uh, constantly asking me uh, about this, Willie Rennie, outside the chamber, can put a bit more pressure, as I am doing, uh, on the Labour Party to try to get them off the fence into a supporting position. And then we perhaps in the new year can see the momentum towards a second referendum becoming unstoppable. Willie Rennie. Uh, with, with great foresight, the First Minister has anticipated my question. <laughs> The, the, Labour Party, the Labour Party was once a beacon of hope in the world. Now the Labour Party isn't even a beacon of hope for the Labour Party. Chuka Amuna, Kezia Dugdale, Daniel Johnson, Ian Murray, they all back a people's vote. 86% of Labour members back a people's vote. I am sure the First Minister will be as frustrated as me with a Labour leadership that does everything it possibly can to avoid backing a people's vote. How many Labour supporters have to lose their jobs before the Labour leadership stands, understands there is no such thing as a jobs first Brexit? How chaotic does Brexit have to get before Jeremy Corbyn and Richard Leonard get off their backsides and stand up to stop it? So what words? can the First Minister find to encourage Labour to live up to their responsibilities? First Minister, First Minister, you may ask briefly, but can I suggest to Willie Rennie that the First Minister is not responsible for answering questions on behalf of the Labour Party? <laughs> Very briefly, First Minister. I, I'm always happy to offer my services to the Labour Party if they, they're looking for some real leadership, which they certainly desperately need <laughs> right now. Um, I, I think I'm, I'm getting to like this new style Willie Rennie at FMQ, so we'll see if it continues into 2019. I'm slightly struggling, though, to remember the days of Labour as a beacon of hope. It certainly hasn't been within my lifetime, so um, I, I may have to, uh, to pause on that. But there is, there is a serious issue. I don't think we should fall, and this is advice to myself here as, as much as it is to anybody else, I don't think we should fall into the same trap the House of Commons did yesterday when faced with the biggest crisis uh, the UK uh, has faced uh, for a long, long, long uh, time to become uh, some kind of pantomime exercise. There is a serious issue here. 
Uh, it is obvious to me that the Prime Minister's tactics are, are to run down the clock uh, so that it gets to a point where it's either uh, her deal or no deal. I, I think that is a, a dreadful approach to be taken when there are alternatives. Uh, but it also seems to me that that is Jeremy Corbyn's is. tactic as well, to try to run down the clock so that he doesn't have to take a decision on a second referendum. So I know he's not in this chamber, presiding officer, but I would appeal to Jeremy Corbyn over the Christmas break to reflect, yes, on uh, the views of his own party uh, and the reviews of many of his MPs, uh, and above all else, the interests of people, the length and breadth of the UK, and to come back in the new year supporting uh, a second EU referendum so that people across the UK can get the opportunity at long last to reverse Brexit and find a way out of this sorry mess. Uh, I think that would be good news for the new year if Jeremy Corbyn found it within himself to show that kind of leadership. Some further supplementaries. The first from Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. First Minister, there are currently 22 child refugees, boys between the age of 14 and 17, not that much older than my son, who have been accepted under the Dub scheme and are currently stuck at Cali waiting for a local authority placement. And the organisation Safe Passage is liaising with the Home Office that there's a bottleneck in sourcing placements. And they've reached out to Scotland, they've reached out to Scottish local authorities who have been so generous in the past. And I know that the, the Scottish Government has been in contact with both COSLA and the Home Office, but that our care system is currently at capacity. So this is an impossible situation, a heartbreaking one, but, but not one that we can accept. And therefore, I simply ask the First Minister what more can be done by her, her government, and actually all of us uh, here today to really get behind, galvanise efforts to find a solution uh, for all uh, of, of our children this Christmas. First Minister. Can I... Thank Angela Constance for raising uh, this hugely important issue. She's absolutely right to identify this as a heartbreaking situation and it's one, of course, the Scottish Government is uh, very aware of. Uh, we've been clear and we will continue to be clear about the need to welcome unaccompanied children into the UK and to support their recovery from the trauma that they have endured. Uh, the Scottish Government, as Angela Constance has already indicated, has been in touch with both COSLA and the Home Office and we appreciate the urgency of this situation. While I gather that there are physically no placements to offer these children in Scotland at the present time, COSLA does continue to work with the Home Office and Scottish local authorities to identify appropriate placements for unaccompanied children uh, when they are available. So I will give Angela Constance and the Chamber the assurance uh, that the Scottish Government will continue to do all that we possibly can uh, to work with COSLA, with the Home Office uh, and to offer the support, uh, the practical support that these young people uh, so desperately need. We will continue to monitor the situation over the holiday period and we will offer any help and support that we possibly can. James Kelly to be followed by Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Ferret Online blog reported at the weekend that government ministers had held 14 meetings with representatives of the airline industry who were lobbying for a cut in the proposed airport departure tax. Uh, can the First Minister explain why, uh, when trade unionists lobbied this parliament last week, no government minister was available to meet the lobby and yet government ministers are falling over themselves to meet uh, members of the, uh, the air airport executives lobbying for a cut that would take money from the Scottish Government future budgets. First Minister. <clears throat> Firstly, of course, all uh, of ministers' engagements uh, are published uh, online, so there is uh, no secrecy uh, about that at all. Uh, ministers meet with a whole range of interests. I meet with almost countless uh, numbers of individuals and organisations over uh, any given year. I, I would hazard a guess that if we weren't doing that, James Kelly would be one of the first to get to his feet and criticise us for not getting out there and meeting different interests. Uh, I meet with trade unions. All ministers meet with trade unions regularly. I uh, do the biannual uh, meeting with the STUC. We have a very good relationship with the STUC. We have a very good relationship uh, with individual trade unions. At times, uh, of course, that will be a re relationship with tension in it, as it is with all governments, as there are issues that we are trying 
to resolve. But this government uh, values and respects trade unions. We put fair work at the heart of our agenda and we will continue to make sure that the views and the values of trade unions run strongly through everything this government does. And I hope we have the support, certainly from that side of the chamber, I'm not sure we'll have the support from the other side of the chamber uh, as we do that. But we'll also uh, meet with businesses, those who run our airports, interests in every corner of the country, because that's what an open, accessible, listening, engaging government does. And I'm proud that that is exactly what this government is. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. A fortnight ago, I warned the Education Secretary that schools in the North East are at breaking point. And now, new Scottish Government statistics show that in the most deprived areas of Aberdeenshire, four out of every five S3 pupils are not reaching required levels of literacy. 14 years old, and they can't read and write to the expected level. Shocking. Presiding Officer, the First Minister is not giving our kids a chance. After more than a decade of SNP government, will she apologise for failing so many Scottish children? First Minister. I think there's a, a huge amount of misrepresentation in the way that question uh, was asked. Of course, the figures we saw last week show uh, improvement in many of these areas of literacy and numeracy and also uh, is one of the sources of evidence that shows uh, the beginning of a narrowing of the attainment gap and that is because of the efforts uh, that have been placed on that uh, some of the initiatives uh, and progress that I spoke about in response to Richard Leonard earlier uh, so we will continue to do that job to to make progress and to support who, all those who work in our education uh, system. Uh, again, you know, we, we hear in this chamber uh, calls, uh, to be fair to the member, he didn't call for more money uh, for education, but I'm sure uh, that's what he would uh, do, and it's what his colleagues do all the time. But let's remember that the Tories are the party who prioritise tax cuts for the richest in society over investment in our public services. And while that continues to be the case, not very many people, if anybody, are going to take the Tories at all seriously. Question number four, John McAlpine. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the outcome of the recent European Council summit. First Minister. The entirely predictable reaction of the EU27 countries to the Prime Minister's position at last week's summit demonstrates uh, clearly that the UK Government must now stop wasting time. We are now just over three months away from the date the UK is currently due to leave the EU. And it seems clear that as things stand right now that the Prime Minister's deal will be rejected by the House of Commons and will not be renegotiated by the EU. Uh, the best outcome in line with the views of the people of Scotland is to retain EU membership, which is why we support another referendum, as I've just been uh, talking about to Willie Rennie. And it would be outrageous if the Prime Minister's plan uh, was instead to run down the clock to no deal. That simply must not be allowed to happen. Bill McAlpine. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Yesterday, the EU Commission released a number of papers uh, on no deal and uh, said that in the event of a no deal scenario, only basic connectivity would be maintained between Scotland's airports and the continent. Does the First Minister agree with me that we should, in such circumstances, we should revoke Article 50 to prevent a no deal? First Minister. Jo McAlpine is absolutely right. My uh, position and view is very clear, uh, and I made this view clear to the Prime Minister yesterday in London. Uh, the government should, uh, at this stage, request an extension of Article 50. Now, uh, an extension would have to be agreed by the EU 27, but it should do that to allow time for a second EU referendum. And if the result of that referendum, as I hope it would be, is remain not just in Scotland, but across the UK, then Article 50 can be revoked. We know from the recent ECJ uh, court judgment that it is possible for the UK to retain membership on current terms contrary to the false choice that's been offered uh, by the Prime Minister. Uh, she seems to me to have given up trying to make any positive case for her bad deal and instead extraordinarily for a government leader is threatening to impose the disaster of a no deal outcome on people she's supposed to serve. Uh, and following the EC judgment, uh, that is not a tenable position and it's certainly not a necessary position. So I would call on the UK government to start acting in the interest of the people it serves, uh, ask for that extension, allow people to look at this again, uh, and if people change their minds to revoke Article 50 and end this sorry mess once and for all. Question five, Graham Simpson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister by how much Council's core budgets will change under the draft budget. 
First Minister. In the context of a Scottish Government uh, budget that is being cut in real terms across this decade by the Conservative Government at Westminster, uh, this Government continues to treat local government uh, fairly with a total funding package of £11.1 billion. Uh, the local government settlement for the coming year provides an increase in local government day-to-day -day spending for revenue services of £197.5 million, that's 2%. And provides an increase in investment for capital spending of £207.6 million, 23.7% increase. Of course, local authorities also have the ability to raise an additional £80 million to support essential services should they choose to use the power to increase council tax by 3%. Taken together, the total funding settlement delivers an increase in the overall resources to support local services of £495 million. That's a real terms increase of 2.7%. Graham Simpson. Um, the First Minister has avoided answering the question as usual. She will have seen the figures that we all saw from Spice this week, which provide the actual answer she should have given. Because once you strip away ring fence money, then councils face a real terms cut of £319 million. That's £43 million in Glasgow, £22 million in Edinburgh. 19.8 million in North Lanarkshire and 9.8 million in Dundee. No council escapes. So if the First Minister really believes councils are getting a fair funding settlement, perhaps she could name a single one that will not either have to increase council tax, cut services or a combination of both. Name one. First Minister. Well. First of all, the totality of the money that local government has to spend is what matters. But let me quote, let me quote uh, the Spice report. Uh, Once revenue funding within other portfolios, but still from the Scottish Government to local authorities, is included, uh, the total is a cash increase of 3.8% uh, or 2% uh, percent in real terms. That is the reality. But I will... It's for councils to set their own budgets. But I make, I, I make this same offer to the Conservatives as I made, uh, of course, to Labour last week. If the Conservatives want more money to go to local government in the budget, we will listen, but they need to come to us and tell us where in the budget they want that money to come from. And they need to tell us how that is possible when they're proposing to take half a billion pounds out of the budget for public services and give it to people in tax cuts for a higher rate taxpayers. The Tories simply have no credibility on this issue. None. So we will wait with bated Zero. breath. The Tories are free to bring Zero. forward proposals, funded proposals. Let's see over the next few weeks whether the Tories step up to the plate and do that or not. Question number six, David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of the capacity of NHS 24 to deal with demand over the Christmas period. First Minister. All health boards, including NHS 24, submit winter plans every year to the Government. These plans are uh, stringently reviewed to ensure that each board has the capacity and the contingency measures in place to deal with increased pressures which winter and the festive period bring. <coughs> NHS 24 uh, submitted their final winter plan on the 31st of October. This was assessed and signed off on the 16th of November. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Last Christmas saw unprecedented burdens on our hard-pressed frontline NHS staff. But for many Scots who are elderly, have chronic health problems or a disability and have little family support, the festive season is a time for anxiety and concern, not celebration. Can the First Minister reassure Parliament today that vulnerable people shouldn't have to wait hours for a response for NHS 24? Can they rely on a festive gift of timely support? They deserve nothing less. First Minister. I agree with that. It's important to note that NHS 24 continues to provide a very highly effective and safe triage system. They answer almost 1.6 million calls in 2017-18. And the important point to stress is around 70% of these calls are handled by NHS 24 without any requirement for a call back to the patient. Where there is uh, a callback required, clinical priority very much uh, determines the time frame in which that callback takes place. Uh, we do recognise that the demands on all health boards, but particularly 
on a health board like NHS 24 increase over the winter and the festive period. Uh, that's why we are ensuring that there are higher numbers of staff working uh, in NHS 24 over the peak festive period this year than uh, last year. I can tell the Chamber that the uh, number of call handlers uh, and nurses that will be working on Boxing Day, mm -hmm. for example, uh, this year will be 458 compared to 397 last year and 373 uh, the year uh, before. Uh, so we will continue to work with NHS 24 to make sure that it provides the service that people uh, demand and expect. Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One of the pressures on the ND departments at this time of year is a result of an increase in trips, slips and falls. Can I ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government promotes safety, particularly to older people, during um, snowy and icy conditions? First Minister. A very uh, good question and uh, I can tell Claire Adamson in the Chamber that we uh, always advise people, particularly the elderly, to take obviously extra care at this time of year. Uh, we encourage people to take sensible measures to prepare and to look out for their neighbours who might need an extra hand during periods of severe weather. Uh, the Ready Scotland website is a source of very useful advice uh, on what to do to prepare uh, for icy weather conditions and we can all play our part in giving the right advice to people but also looking out for people who might need extra help over the winter period. And question number seven, Edward Mountain. Thank you, officer. To ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government will acknowledge the people from across the country who will be working over the festive period to keep Scotland going. First Minister. Yeah, I'm very happy not just to acknowledge but also take the opportunity to thank on behalf of the Scottish Government and I'm sure the Scottish people, all those who will be working over the festive period, such as those in our emergency services, those who keep our transport moving and people in the hospitality sector, uh, to name just a few. We value very highly the contribution they make throughout the year. However, at this time of year, it is particularly important to recognise their efforts in keeping Scotland going. I'm sure the whole chamber will wish to join with me uh, to say a very big thank you to everyone working over the festive period. And although they may be working, uh, nevertheless, to wish them a very happy Christmas. Edward, Edward Mountain. I thank the First Minister for that answer and I also would like to pay tribute to the emergency services and public services working over the Christmas period including NHS, fire, police and I would also like to particularly mention the voluntary groups that are working over the Christmas period such as Mountain Rescue Service, the Coast Guard, RNI and Samaritans and I would be grateful if the First Minister could, could acknowledge the extra work that they'll be putting in over the festive period as well. First Minister. Um, I'm certainly very happy to do that. Volunteers, the length and breadth of our country, uh, make a huge contribution all year round, but it's important, particularly at this time of year, to recognise what they do in some of the organisations that Edward Mountain has mentioned. Uh, the Mountain Rescue, the Coast Guard, uh, all do an absolutely exemplary job. So let me uh, take the opportunity to thank everybody who will be working hard to keep the rest of us safe uh, over this period. And since this may uh, be my last answer, uh, presiding officer, although that's entirely up to you, of course, uh, I'll take the opportunity to wish you and everybody across the chamber a very happy Christmas. Thank you very much. On that cheery note, that concludes uh, First Minister's questions. I wish you a Merry Christmas and I close this meeting. <laughs>